podcasting will will be a thrill. Grandpa and chill, grandson and friends. Grandpa and chill in full effect. We talk about it all, yeah, put it all on the set with that pet craze too. We chillin' with Rosie, come through, stay tuned, yeah, listen closely. Cause this the millennials and the silent generation coming together, discussion in rotation. This is Grandpa and Chill. Hello, welcome. Welcome to another beautiful episode of Grandpa and Chill with our beautiful host, Brandon Fox. Ooh, finest Jackson. Ah, and above all, Grandpa Bart. Today, our guest is the wonderful, beautiful writer, producer, director, Steve Stockman. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks. It's great to be here. I, I was promised more of a technical snafu than I'm getting. I, uh, in the- <laughs> no, no, no. We, we, it's we can coming. Do the- it's coming. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. You get all the ticks. It mm. well, never starts job. at the beginning. That's too easy. Yeah. <laughs> Where is home for you? Where are you based out of? I'm based in Los Angeles. Oh, cool. Has the city completely changed in the last week from all the strike stuff? Um, has it changed in the last week? Yeah, everybody's, uh, you know, rushing back to work as fast as is humanly possible. Um, I think there was a more immediate change from the 10 freeway shutting down downtown. That was a little bit more of a problem for, for people. Um, so I think that was a, uh, that was a big issue, you know, but we're, we're shut the freeway down. They didn't shut it down. Somebody lit a fire under it. And when they lit a fire under it, they caused the buttresses and the things that support the actual road that people drive across to uh, crack and pop and fall apart. And uh, oh, wow. it, caused, oh. it caused them to shut it down in order that uh, they might avoid someone falling through the freeway onto the ground below. So. So, so that like was that was their reasoning, situation. which I you can't fault them really, you know. It, it yeah. sounds so. like a similar situation we had in Philadelphia. Part of I ninety five got shut down because of a fire under the bridge. I can't hear that well, Grandpa. No, yeah, can you turn your volume up a little bit, Grandpa? Can you, is this better? No. Hello. Uh, uh, is it all, mm. more would be better. Hello. Now I don't know. Oh. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Is that better? Scream into the mic. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? No. <laughs> yeah. I it's just... the the fun part. The fun part, Steve, about having a podcast where uh, the host and then some frequent guests are eighty plus is it's all remote. So every every episode's a new journey. <laughs> well, that's great. It's an adventure. Yeah. It's important yeah, to have it that feels like it. that experience. You know. So that's true. I'm just teasing, Grandpa. I love you. You're uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you better. Great. Okay. Great. Uh, what were you been, saying yeah. about Philly? Yeah, is there something about bridges? <laughs> uh, no, I I saw them. Uh, in, you were saying, yeah. No, I just I, I, I go ahead. I I just said that we had a similar situation in Philadelphia. A truck caught on fire underneath uh, Interstate 95 and shut it down. They had to rebuild that. S- small section of 95 yeah and they you know did what? it really fast I, right they did yeah unbelievable yeah yes i didn't think much about that but it makes sense about how bridges are made that heat underneath it would cause some type of issue i guess heat yeah that's pretty cool yeah generally not good to set your bridges on fire <laughs> no <laughs> it's, what I, it's what i've heard i'm no expert in engineering but depends where you're at in society yeah Yeah, (laughs) that's true yeah and the traffic in la is already horrible as is right it's like i've heard so i've heard yeah i think it's you know it it gets a lot of hype i mean i i think it's the same traffic jams as everywhere else it's just that we have eight lanes of them instead of two lanes of them and so everybody goes oh my god the traffic but in terms of delay you know i've been delayed more in boston and new york then i get delayed in los angeles most of the time yeah. um, but yes there's definitely traffic don't don't are you born and raised in in los angeles 
I was not. I was born and raised in upstate New York, and then I lived in New England for a long time. Uh, but I've lived here for uh, 30 years. I kind of wow. like it. I'm very superficial, yeah. so I fit right in, you know? Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Makes it easy. Yes. Exactly. Finest is in New York City. I don't know if you've ever driven. Have you driven in New York City, Finest? I have, yeah. I've driven actually way more than I thought I would. Oh, yeah, it's pretty hellish. It's pretty... It is. <laughs> yeah. I don't have an I don't have enough uh driver energy to like to to be having that aggression. It's you know it's harder on the like not the highway. I thought I was more afraid of being on the highway. It's not that that's not the scary part. It's like driving on the regular old like I don't know, just the regular streets of New York that are like way too much for me. People are just like crossing over lanes to get places and like I'm I'm way too passive. Um to be out there on those lanes. But it's good, yeah. 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 Good learning what, lessons. What was the what was the initial day that moved you from um or New York to LA? Is that what you said? From Boston. No, Boston. Um, yeah. I wanted to do uh films and television and this is where they're done. You know? Yeah. Um yeah. people shoot everywhere, but all the decisions are mostly made here. And um, I was doing a lot of commercials in Boston, which I really loved, and I love Boston. But if you want to, you know, hang out with other people who are writing scripts or talking about their TV deals, you really have to come here because that's all everybody's doing in Starbucks, you know. Um, <laughs> and so it was a great motivator because I met a lot of people who were doing what I wanted to do, and and uh, kind of developed a network of friends at my level and and grew with them. So that was a good, it was a good move. You know, I really love commercials, but they're sort of like the haiku of the film world. You know, they're very short and you have to really tell a ton of story in a really short shot. And that's great training for film and television. I, I think that directors who come from commercials often have a, you know, a ton of skill from all that practice, really compressing the story into a little tiny bit. But if you want to stretch and tell something longer, you need something, you know, a longer medium. So did, did you have that community right when you got out there or that was something that took a little bit in LA? I think it takes a, it takes a bit to learn. Fortunately, I, I had small children um, that were just emerging at the time that we moved here. And so, you know, there's nothing like the school to, you know, where everybody's a producer or director or a, grip or an actor you know and yeah. so suddenly you're dropped into it and um also you know i've been in show business for a really long time so when i started my career in, in show business i started in radio and i worked a lot with you know concerts and artists and national tours and publicity and all that other stuff so i was pretty tied in from the get-go uh to an extent and um Moving here wasn't a big shock to my system. Yeah. Gotcha. Did Did you feel any like um, going from commercials to longer uh, storytelling? Did was it like a learning curve or or to, to yeah. like stretch your storyline out? I mean, to stretch it out a little bit or? or what? It, it's funny because in this in in my book and in the video course I just finished, we talk about the kind of the basics of shooting video, which is to think in terms of shots, in terms of short units of time that when cut together, create a story. So amateurs, you know, turn on their camera and they point it. And then when something else happens, they go over here and point it over there. And then they point it over there and they leave it run for like 20 minutes. And then they look at it and go, why is this boring? But professionals work in short shots and they know those are gonna be cut together or you can just shoot them that way in the camera and get a much better video just to start with. So the principles of video are all the same. So whether you're doing a YouTube video now or you're doing a commercial or you're doing a movie, the principle that you wanna use shots, that you wanna keep people's visual interest, that you want to develop a um, storyline that, that holds them and is interesting to them, those principles are all the same. What's the surprising difference if you're going from a commercial to um, a half hour show, which was my first big step up in production, 
is the amount of work and the number of people you need to do it. So, so doing a commercial, I can work with one editor and one effects guy, and then I have a crew of 50 people, but once the shooting is done, it becomes a very small process and it only takes a few weeks to finish off. If you're doing, if you go from a 30 second commercial to six half hours for the Food Network, suddenly you've got eight editors and a whole bunch of effects people and you've got story people and you've got like a giant office full of people working on that show and it takes eight weeks to 10 weeks to finish and you have to talk to the network. And so just the amount of work is gigantic compared to the amount of work to doing a commercial. And then when you step up to an hour, you know, and you're delivering a bunch of hour shows for NBC Universal, that's like way more work. And so that's always a surprise, you know, um, that that growth from place to place. But it's mostly about management and workflow because um, you got a big army of people doing stuff. And the bigger the job is, the more time it consumes, the bigger the army. And uh, so that that was the surprise. But in principle, they should be the same, but in practice, it's a lot harder to do a long piece. I've, I've noticed uh, that commercials uh, are very good quality. They're excellent, the quality of the audio, mm -hmm. the quality of, of the uh, video. Uh, I had experience. I worked for a, a, a commercial uh, film company uh, several years ago in Los Angeles called Wakeford Orloff. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but they may not be around um. anymore. Why they hired mm -hmm. me, I'll never know, as stage manager, because I knew nothing about what I was doing. But um, this goes way back. And we did Revlon, Afro Sheen, Honda, mm -hmm. various ads. Well, so the great thing about commercials is you get to play with a lot of toys over a very short period of time. So, you know, on a commercial, you might, you know, have a half a million dollar budget to crank out a commercial and you'd have 12 hours to do it in. The equivalent feature, you know, if you look at half a million dollars for 30 seconds, the equivalent feature is somewhere in the hundred million dollar range, you know, because you are, sorry, that's not right. Hang on, 30, 200, it's, it's, yeah, that's, it's, it, it gets really expensive. I'm doing the math in my head as I talk to you. And it's like, wait a minute, 30 seconds, so that's a million dollars a minute. And, a, and 120 minutes. Yeah, that's right. $120 million if you're spending at that rate. So that's a pretty big movie. And that takes a really long time to do. But commercials, you know, you can, because you're working with an advertiser with a big budget and they're going to spend a ton of money on TV, they'll, they'll spend a lot of money to get stuff done really fast. And you get to play with all the new toys and you get to try cool shots and you get to do a lot of stuff that you don't get to do on your very first feature, which is not a $120 million feature, it's more like a $3 million feature. So you have a lot less money to spend over a longer period of time, if that makes sense. We, we had on uh, many episodes ago, the creator producer for uh, Diners, Dive-Ins and Drives. Uh -huh. And we were, we were shocked at just like the, the vastness that, you know, cause it's shot so simply and we're like, oh, it's probably just a dude with a camera and you go, but no, like hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah. Very disturbing. Yeah. Especially if, it, especially the more episodes you're doing at once, you know, the more yeah. the hundreds and hundreds of people pile up because yeah. you're shooting one while you're planning another one, while you're editing another one, while you're writing another one, while you're talking to the network about next season. And all that takes just a huge amount of time. Yeah. You got a, a, a bright shine to you, Brandon. What what's got you so excited about the topic? What about oh, I know you I know you, no no. Oh there. yeah, whatever. <laughs> I I'm talking about you seem like you I know you're an actor and you like film, but I'm I'm I'm, yeah, I'm interested. Yeah. yeah, tell us why you're so what, what we were talking about before. So my grandpa, uh mm -hmm. five years ago, I don't know when it was, but his two later in life hobbies and passions have become um, video recording and audio recording. So he's done a lot of really high quality videos uh, st or audio stuff and uh, mm -hmm. has a really nice camera. Um, and I was really excited to come on because um, I'm shooting my first uh, like just micro short with uh, some a few friends. Um, literally 
the this weekend so like yeah wow. yeah and I, I was going through the tips and stuff it's very cool cool oh well, good good luck yeah what's, yeah. what's it about i will need it i will need it um the 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 plot of the short it's basically just um uh, a, a person in georgia who's uh, struggling with a drug problem um and it's the last time he ever uses pretty much so yeah. hmm yeah, very light Great. material. <laughs> very light material. It's clear. Yeah. Full, full of laughs. Um, yeah, but that's yeah. great. I look forward to seeing it. Yeah. 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 Um, then, uh, yeah sorry. sorry. But... No, 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 no. Go, no, Brandon, please. I actually. Oh, I was just going to say that uh, Grandpa's gotten very good in his old age with audio and all of that kind of stuff. It's very hard, very technical. Uh, primarily audio. I uh, tried um, video with uh, some Sony equipment. And found that it's a lot different from audio. There's a lot to know, and which I don't know. And once in a while, a musician or a group will ask to have a video, but I do the most simple one camera, you know, sh video, and it's it's a complicated, very different from yeah. from doing. Audio. You know what's interesting is that this thing, this this phone, this this shoots better footage than alfred hitchcock could shoot in 1953 you know i mean the the you needed like a crew of a hundred just to get the lighting that this phone does all by itself so it's funny because one of the things that i try to talk about is it's like equipment is not the most important thing when you're thinking about video it's really what you're going to shoot why you're going to shoot it so it's where you point the camera and where you turn it on, but I can get, you know, 24 frames a second, um, 4K footage exactly like I will get from a super fancy uh, camera that I'll use on a commercial out of this thing. And it's got a couple of lenses and, and you can adjust those and then you can correct the footage later and you can cut it and looks great. So I think the, I think one of the things to think about is if the, the camera's kind of a pain and it's confusing or it's got a lot of stuff that you don't really want to know is just use your phone because they make tripods for the phone. Um, you could have five people with phones shooting footage at the same time and then cut it together um, for, for a music video or something. And it's really about what you shoot, where you point the camera, not what camera you're using. Is it um, really the quality of an airy or a red it, it isn't because it's a little more compressed or or a little bit more um it's kind of jacked they've got algorithms in these in these phones that you know make your sunsets beautiful and they adjust for what they think people want to see so it's not as flexible or as um precise as those cameras but yeah the 4k and an iphone and the 4k and some of these other like a black magic they're gonna with those exceptions the algorithmic adjustments and stuff they're gonna look pretty damn good and most of the stuff online is still at 1080 hd you know so you're gonna dumb it down to put it on youtube anyway and so the practical difference, it, it's like people get hung up on equipment, but equipment is not the big problem. The big problem is people have no idea how to shoot a video that someone will actually want to watch. Yeah, and it's damn, right? compli damn complicated shooting, I know. Yeah, you have to really think about how people think about video, you know, and how and what they want to watch and what you're trying to get across. And those are the hard parts. Um, so I would say if you're if you're having trouble with, you know, the fancy camera, dumb it down a little bit, shoot with, you know, her, your best phone and, um, you know, you'll have that great audio and you'll, you'll kick butt with it. It'll look really good. I got rid of a, a Sony FX6. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but mm -hmm. it's a pretty good camera. Uh, and I just, too much for me to learn. Uh, yes. I just, so just, yeah, just use your phone or bring in a couple of kids and let them use their phones, then take all the footage and, and uh, because you have music playing in the background if you're doing a music video and you can just cut their footage to the sync of the music that's playing and it'll look great. Yeah. Um, this kind of takes me to my next question 
for um people doing their first or, or like people to play around with the camera like um me or or Brandon making his first microfilm or anybody really just kind of playing around what if what experience advice would you give someone that's brand new or just getting their feet wet um cuz also I'll say too what what you're talking about I I'm not a director or do anything with film but I like storytelling I love comics and I read about comics and I read about comic theory mm -hmm. And I um, love that storytelling uh, aspect. And a lot of stuff that you're saying reminds me of, and when I'm reading about comic theory, I learn, I'm like, this reminds me of direct, it sounds, looks like someone's making a movie. Um, so like, yeah, like, is there anything that you, if you could start off as like, uh, if you go back to young Steve first starting off, um, what advice would you give them to, to, to well, your first? Like, well, first, uh, don't be hard on yourself because your first videos are gonna be terrible. Um, but my first videos were terrible and I'm sure Steven Spielberg's first videos were terrible. Um, and it just takes some practice and you have to figure out what you're doing. The only way to get better is to shoot your first micro production, you know, and shoot stuff around the family and shoot exercises and things to get better at what you're doing. But that aside, um, the first thing that I always tell people to look at when they're 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 looking at creating video is that video is told in shots. So if you if you watch TV, you are never going to see a 20 minute shot um, unless it's a special fancy effects thing on a big budget shoot um, like the end of Children of Men, you know, which looks like one shot for an hour. But it, it isn't. But it looks like it. And. But normally a shot is like one second to 10 seconds long, maybe 15 seconds, and it contains one person doing one thing. So if you think about your, uh, even a home video of your daughter's birthday party, instead of just waving the camera around, what you wanna do is find one person doing one thing that you wanna remember. So your daughter tasting her first birthday cake when she's one and taking that first bite of chocolate cake. Um, or your daughter later smearing chocolate cake on her face. You know, these are short shots. And if you go through that birthday party and you find the short shots, someone opening a present, uh, two people hugging that haven't seen each other in a while, a short conversation on the couch about the birthday girl, um, you know, her opening her presents and then playing with the boxes and leaving the presents on the floor. These are all short little things, but when you edit them together, or really you don't even have to edit them, you just dump them out together into one movie and whatever free editing program you have. It's gonna look much more like a watchable piece of television or film than what you were doing before. So that- Wow, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping thought, but it kind of reminds me of like how my phone will be like, Here's a snapshot of last year and it like has some music playing and then there's a bunch of like random pictures from that you know you took a thousand pictures from that party but they 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 pick like a couple of them and then you know they got the whole year um is that it i mean not i mean there's more to it of course than that but like that that's kind of like what we're what you're well, describing the, the truth is that if you just if you go into a birthday party and you just shoot short shots of people doing stuff and then you dump them out into an editing program and make a three minute movie out of it. Yes, it actually will look way better than what you're probably shooting if you haven't done that. But once you understand how shots work, <laughs> then you have to start to think about the story that you're telling with those shots. So what actions are you going to shoot? Right? So mm -hmm. if you're going to, if you're going to point your camera at your daughter, you're going to shoot her doing something like taking the bite of cake then you're gonna stop your camera and you're gonna to move to something else that you find interesting. So now we go from the first kind of automatic, oh, if you shoot short shots, they'll look much better, which is true. Then we go to, well, which short shots do you wanna shoot? And that means that you look around the room and you see what's going on and you see what's interesting and you see Aunt Sally over here on her third beer and you see uh, you know, your mother-in-law coming in and, and cleaning around the, countertop like she always does and you you find those things that you find amusing or interesting or that tell the story of the birthday party and you go shoot those so step one is think in shots and only shoot short bits of video but step two is 
think about where you are and what story you want to tell and which short shots of video you want to shoot. So that's where you start to step up from the computer automatically assembling a movie or a slideshow for you. You're blowing my mind. Because um, I, I really, I mean, because I'm putting it towards like my drawings and stuff like that, but it it, it does kind of make sense what he's saying. Like, of I, I have a hard time telling stories uh, or trying to even get anything even started um, telling stories. Uh, so I like you're giving me some very good advice of of where to go um, or little hangups I have, which is like, I have a bunch of drawings, but don't really know what to like, where to go with them. Or yeah, kinda so, like a... so story is, uh, story confuses people because it's a big buzzword in the, in the, in the business world. You know, everybody has to tell a story about their business and they have to uh, have a story about their mission and all this other stuff. And then there's all the the Joseph Campbell and the um, the big storytelling books that that tell you the science of storytelling. You can buy self-help books, but story at its essence is super simple. So here it is. Maybe this will help you. The, the story is about a hero, a human being, right, who has something that happens to them or something that they do better still with a beginning, middle and an end. So if you think of it that simply and you're really disciplined about it, all your video stuff and probably your drawing stuff will get better. So the question you want to ask at um, the birthday party is who's the hero? What's the beginning? What's the middle and what's the end? Right? So if the hero is if you decide that the hero of this video you're doing of the birthday party is going to be your one-year-old daughter, then you're going to be down on her level and you're going to be shooting what she does and you're going to be focused on how people interact with her, right? And that's going to be your three-minute video and you're going to look at the beginning, which kind of, it's the event, right? The beginning is she's, you know, excited that people are coming to see her and saying hi to her and the middle is... You know, she is getting cake and eating it. And at the end, she's falling asleep in a pile of wrapping paper, right? So that's your beginning, middle, and end. The hero is your daughter. Now you've told a coherent story, right? Um, but if you shift that point of view and you make the hero uh, your grandmother, your daughter's great-grandmother, who hasn't met your daughter yet, then the story might start at the door where you open the door and great grandma comes in and sees your daughter for the first time and how they relate to each other for that first time. And then it might be great grandma sitting down next to the birthday girl and giving her some cake. And then it might be great grandma in the bathtub getting the cake off the daughter, you know, and cleaning her up for the night and then reading her story and putting her to bed. That's a different story with a different hero but it also has a beginning where they meet, the middle where they do the birthday stuff, and the end where they get ready for bed. So what I would say is whenever you look at a home movie situation or a documentary movie situation, or uh, for that matter, uh, you know, this is what we look at in, in film scripts that we write. What's the, who's the hero? Who's this really about? What's the beginning of the story? what's the middle of the story and what's the end of the story. And if you can do those three simple things, your stuff will just get light years better. Uh, like it's like magic. Wow. Do, do you do that uh, for film also per scene or is that just the overarching script itself? Um, yes, yes, per scene. In fact, you okay. can do it in a shot, right? So beginning, middle, end. Yeah, so 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 if you think hero beginning middle and end, um, are we all familiar with Star Wars? Yes. The movie. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> in Star Wars, the hero of the movie is Luke Skywalker, and at the beginning he wants to get off the planet, right? And in and he meets this uh, weird guy who takes him off planet, this uh, Obi Wan Kenobi, right? And then in the middle he hooks up with these other guys and becomes part of the rebel alliance. And then at the end, he kills the Death Star. So that's the big movies, beginning, middle and end. The hero is Luke Skywalker. Inside that movie, there are sequences. So a sequence might be uh, 
Obi-Wan Kenobi and Han Solo negotiating for a flight on uh, the Millennium Falcon. Millennium Falcon, right? So they're in the bar and they're meeting for the first time. So the sequence is at the beginning, they meet. In the middle, they negotiate. And at the end, they, they run away and get on the Millennium Falcon and take off. And that's a sequence, right? Inside that sequence, there are scenes. So one scene is the bar where the weird animals are playing. And one scene is uh, the negotiation that takes place at the table with Han Solo. And another scene is Obi-Wan Kenobi getting into the city and, and telling the guards, these are not the droids you're looking for. These are all scenes, right? They consist of multiple shots. But then if you go down even more to a shot, a shot has a hero, a beginning, middle, and end as well. So a shot could be um, Obi-Wan Kenobi waving, waving his hand at a guard to kind of convince them that these aren't the droids they're looking for. Just that shot, the hero is Obi-Wan Kenobi, and the, the beginning is he looks at a guard, and the middle is he waves his hand, and the end is they drive through. And that's one shot. So yeah. you actually can apply it at every single level of, of film storytelling, and I would say comic book storytelling as well. And for that shot level, is that a can, you can or you should for the beginning, like having a... Well, like, there's no rules in art, right? But I yeah. would certainly say you should, yes. And I would okay. also say that the better you do it, the, the better your film will be, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when you're doing a commercial... Um, and I have some examples in my in my video course of uh, I break down a sattva commercial that I wrote. Uh, I didn't write actually; they wrote it, gave it to me. I shot it. Um, sattva is a, a mattress company that makes really great mattresses that you order online. So each each single shot in that thirty second commercial has a hero, a beginning, middle, and an end. Right. So the hero might be somebody's hand going like this. But it's still the hero is the hand. The action is comes into frame, snaps, goes out of frame, right? So yeah, we break it down to that level of detail wow. to make commercials because they're really short commercials, and some shots are like two and a half seconds long, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to get it in there. And if you if you're not shooting an action, you might as well take a still photograph, right? So you got to really wow. think about that. Steve, uh, as a business idea, without the business aspect of it, what is the issues with uh, doing a video of, say, I'm sure you're familiar with QVC, mm -hmm. of, of doing something like that, you know, in a small setup, uh, setting up with a, with a, film, with a uh, TV company to, uh, to broadcast it? And uh, to do your own, you, to make your own QVC? Basically, yes, but in a very, very small scale. Yeah, I mean, what's the. Yeah, I'm not, uh, unfortunately, as a director, that doesn't really fall into my area of expertise. I, I've always liked QVC as a concept, but I don't, I don't know a lot about their business model. Um, so it's hard for me to comment on that. But I would say, you know, one of the interesting things about them, if you want to relate it to this story example, is that. They're constantly telling stories about the products they sell, and the and they only. I do know this from talking to my book publisher about being on QVC, which they sometimes were able to finagle, is that they'll bring you in if you can tell a great story and keep people listening and paying attention, and that story is about your great product and that you know works mm. to sell it. So well, that's helpful. That mm -hmm. says a lot. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the book, uh, what was your inspiration for going from uh, film scripts and all of this directing to wanting to create something to sort of give back or help out? I have, um, I'm the president of the board of trustees of this thing called Summer Star, the Summer Stars Foundation. And Summer Stars does a uh, camp every summer for 150 <laughs> uh, 12 to 17 year old underserved kids in the Boston and New York area. So they get to come for free to this overnight performing arts boot camp um, that uh, teaches them 
through the performing arts, how to succeed, how to really work with a team, how to take risks, all that creativity stuff. So I started teaching video uh, 20 plus years ago there. And as video became more popular, and because people knew I was a director, they started asking my advice on stuff. It was like, being a doctor, except when you'd go to the party, nobody would say to you, hey, could you look at this pimple on my neck? They would say, hey, I got a video. Could you watch this for me and tell me what's wrong with it? And what I found is it was always the same problems. And it was the problems that I was teaching kids in this music video course where they learned how to shoot music videos, which we we put up in the in the show at the end of the week. And so I had developed this curriculum and I really liked to teach. Uh, and video was not getting any smaller, you know, it was getting gigantic. So I wrote the book in order to kind of share that curriculum with, um, with everybody who's interested. And there's a, the audio book surprisingly sells quite well also because you don't really need to see what I'm talking about to understand it. And now the video series for people who would prefer to see examples and all that is also doing great. So. You do all of that? You read it? You do the videos? I did. I didn't. I I I was a talent on the video, which I don't normally do. I've snuck myself into a couple of things I've shot over the years, but normally I'm behind the scenes. So, um, so that was kind of a trip. But I think it came out all right. Uh, but yes. So my production company made that. I mean, I didn't personally shoot it. Can you? That's the thing about being a director is mostly you just point. Can you give yeah. me the name <laughs> of one or two products that? that you've done videos that you're, you're proud of uh, something that I might for, for that. like commercials and stuff. Right. Um, I've done commercials for Microsoft, for Disney, for Sattva, for Breville, which is a appliance, uh, you know, like a kitchen appliance <laughs> company. Um, I've done them for, uh, those are some of the big ones. Nokia. I mean, just trying to think of who the, who the larger companies are. But yeah, I've done commercials for all those guys. And I've done, uh, I've sold 12 shows uh, to television, of which six actually made it to the air, which is pretty good. Um, and uh, so some of those, a uh, show called the, the Devil's Ride, which ran on Discovery for three years, and Brew Dogs that ran on NBC Universal for for three seasons um, and a bunch of other ones. Uh, and then I did a film called Two Weeks with Sally Field and Glenn Howerton and Julianne Nicholson and Ben Chaplin, which plays on Showtime quite a lot, um, which was kind of fun also. Um, does it feel like, because I, I know you said there's no rules, it's all art, but when you're in pre-production and production, you're sort of like, pride in a specific project does that feel like luck like when you get to the final cut you're like whoa okay <laughs> we're here or uh do, do you sort of know as you're going through based on the amount of work that's put in and all that kind of stuff where it will end up yeah yeah like how you feel about the final product or um one of the things I've learned as I've done this more is to take the advice of a friend of mine who's a uh, primarily a, a feature writer. And he said to me once when we were hiking, he said, you know, I try never to take on a project that I wouldn't buy a ticket to go see. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was great advice. And so one of the things I've tried to do with my career is to not work on things that I didn't think were interesting and where my vision of how it was gonna come out didn't match the vision of the people who were putting up the money. So um, so that's the, the short, the long answer to your question, kind of, which is if you're doing a project that's well suited to your talents and you love it and you really work hard on it and you kind of know what you're capable of, then more often than not, as you go, it comes out the way you wanted it to come out. Early on, when you're still trying to figure out what you like and, and you're a little less certain on the set and you're more likely to listen to other people who may take you a little bit off track. And also you may work with people you don't like as much because you feel like you need the business. That's when it gets a little iffy, but ideally you get to that point where you're a great match for the project and you really know what to do with it. 
Yeah. You probably have incredible leadership and diplomacy skills, I'm guessing, having directed so much, right? It's a... Not if you ask my wife and kids. <laughs> uh, but yeah, same, but yeah same. on the set, I'm pretty good at, at knowing what's going on, yeah. I see, I see. Cool. Um, and are you still applying? Because the 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 tips that I were looking uh, was looking at, and we can go through them, are very sort of um, some are like obvious, but I'm like, oh, I've never done that before, or I wouldn't even think, you know, just focusing on the whites of the eyes and that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Are you thinking about those specific things, or is it just second nature when you're like on a film set? I think that that at currently at my level of experience, I don't consciously spend time on those. But yeah. what those are, like, don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes, is yeah. a reminder that if you stand too far back from the action, yeah. you can't see people's faces. And faces are what interest us in a story for the most part. I mean, most videos are, and I think most videos should be, about humans doing something. That's the story that we're interested in. Even a home video, if you go to the Grand Canyon with your kids, you know, the Grand Canyon, it's kind of been there for several millennia, right? And it's not likely to change anytime soon. And you can Google it. But the, the part about the Grand Canyon and the trip with your kids that you really want to shoot is your kids with the Grand Canyon as the background, because they're going to change and they're going to be the things you want to remember. And they're going to be the the people who are telling you the interesting story or acting the interesting story. So I like to keep people focused on that and don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes is advice to remind you to stay close enough to people that you can see their faces and their eyes. Cause you know, that with the, the eyes are the windows to the soul. Is that what they say? I think that's, you know, absolutely true. We see so much in people's eyes um, that if you're hanging back on the other side of the room and just randomly pointing your camera, you're not going to get any of that. And then in 20 years, you're going to wish you'd had better video of your kid when she was five, you know? You wish you had that, Grandpa? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's not too late Were to you, start. Uh, Steve, yeah. do you enjoy acting? Do I enjoy acting? Yes, you said you yes. were in a. You said you were in a in one of your shoots or more than one. Yeah, well, I, so I I because I was teaching in the new video version of how to shoot video that doesn't suck that I just did. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, I ended up, you know, as the spokesman and demonstrator for that, and I've always acted, but not generally on camera. So I've done a lot of improv around the Los Angeles area and I do a lot of stage stuff, but, um, but I don't have a lot of on-camera acting experience. So this was kind of a treat for me and it was fun, a little nerve wracking, but fun. What's the, what's the difference? Do you, uh, work with a lot of theater actors in your film? Like, do you notice a stylistic difference? Uh, not anymore. I mean, in the, in the olden days, like 50 years ago, I think not everybody understood acting for film versus acting for theater, but they've gotten substantially closer together because now mm. theater is all mic'd and lit like television. And, mm. and, you know, in television, people understand that they have to really tone it way down and they can't project to the back wall of the theater when you're on mm. camera. So, um, so, and everybody also, it used to be that you were a theater actor or a television actor or a film actor, and now everybody does everything. So those barriers have kind of fallen away. Yeah, I've seen Taylor Swift recently in like a Verizon ad or I, I think it was Verizon, I'm not sure. But uh, it amazes me that somebody like her with, I know she must make very big money, would do something like that. But uh, I guess... I think she was in Cats too, wasn't she? <laughs> I, I heard it's a true. movie everyone's heard of and no one's seen. I yeah. saw it. Yeah. 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 What do you think? It was the last movie I saw before COVID happened. So <laughs> my bad. Did it cause it? Mm, maybe it was. But Taylor oh, Swift was in that, right? 
Yeah. She was wow. in it. Jason Derulo and his bulge were in it. Everybody. Uh, James Corden was in it. Big namers. Uh, never Rosie again. just pulled your glasses out, Grandpa. And dropped. That's uh, she's our mascot. She's the bird uh, who's on the poster of the podcast. So. Oh, very nice. She's I'm sorry I didn't bring a bird. I don't have one. <laughs> well, if you have me back, I... I'll go get a bird first. It really only works if your bird also has some homicidal tendencies. That's kind of yeah, her thing. Even. Oh, I see. All a right. Little bit. More like a raptor than it is a little bird. Um, yeah. Steve, did you say you so, have children? I do. I have two. And and would you encourage them to go in the same profession? Uh, I actually am just finishing a script with my daughter right now. However, she's applying to medical school, so... I don't think that that's the career she wants, but she's a very good writer and she did do a lot of screenwriting in college um, and also newspaper writing. So um, so it's really fun to write with her, but we'll see. You know, Michael Crichton was a doctor and he had a long career in, uh, you know, in, in films and television as well. So um, maybe I can talk her back into the film business and we can get this one sold. We'll see how it goes. I see lots of popular TikTokers that are nurses and doctors and full-time yeah. dentists. So maybe she'll, she'll double time, mm -hmm. get some TikTok money. Oh yeah. yeah. I believe that. Um, that kind of gets me to my next question or I guess leading question is because mm, media and film recording and everyone has a phone and everyone has this really fancy phone that take was a billion dollars back in the day um your skill set that you're teaching seems like it's valuable for everyone right is it is it a valuable thing that everyone wants to teach should i be teaching young people should everyone be taking your course in your classes because we're all we're all starting to care about the yeah. cameras it should be required you should not be able to get past <laughs> 10 years old without taking my video course. Um, however, so so the, the real answer is I think that video literacy is a subject whose time is about to come, you know. Um, if you think about video the way I do, you realize that it's a language, right? It's not any different than English or French or Spanish. And we teach kids in school to... Um, talk about to to learn English so that one, they can get what they need to get done done with the English language so they can read and make sense of signs and also so that they can, um, you know, so that they can communicate in English. But the side effect of teaching someone how to write and read and study essays and short stories and stuff like that is that they learn how they're made and constructed and they learn what's credible and believable and what isn't. And I think that as we get into more of an AI era and as more and more people make video, it's important for us to understand how the language of video works and how you generate emotion using video and how things outside the frame in video may or may not exist. What in what you're seeing may or may not be exactly what you think you're seeing. So you have to look very carefully at how things are constructed and what people are trying to create in you emotionally um, with a piece of video. I think it's as much self-defense and as much important to our future as a society as learning English is and learning how to write. And where we are now is we all watch video and we've been watching it since we were born, right? But we don't speak it very well. And I think if we learn to speak it better, we will also learn to understand it and its effects the way that we understand English, which will be good for us. Are, are videos as effective for the student as a live presentation? Uh, it just depends, you know. Um, it really depends on what it is you're watching in video and what the point of the presentation is. So if you're thinking in classroom, probably not. And the reason probably not is because the professor is probably standing there lecturing and she's doing her conversation with the class that's physically present. And there's probably only one camera and it's deadly dull to watch. You know, you'd probably be better off listening to it. 
Um, so, and having a teacher that you can interact with and ask questions of is obviously better than having someone pre-recorded. Um, so, so I think not. However, there's a lot of work going on with educational training in video and people who are learning how to use video better in order to teach. And so I think, you know, there's a possibility that that will, that will pan out. And I know they're doing, a, you know, lessons on, lessons on video are great for, um, for people who can't get somewhere else. In the case of my video series, the, we worked really hard to use all the principles that we understand about how to make video watchable to make it watchable. And then there's also a lot of demos and exercises and things that you can see. So it's not a lecture of one guy standing there for two and a half hours. It's, it's like short five minute bits and a <laughs> lot of examples and a lot of cutaways and a lot of graphics and things that will keep you visually involved while you go through the material. What, what are, what is the name of your video program? The series is called how to shoot video that doesn't suck. And it's based on my book of the same name. And, um, the book has been the best selling how to video book in the world for about 10 years. Wow. So it's out in nine That's languages totally and there's an audio version and the video series, uh, you can get on my website, stevestockman.com. What do you think you've learned in the last 10 years, uh, that maybe you'd want to insert into the latest edition of the book? That's a great question. So the latest edition of the book is actually only about five years old. Um, so most of it is in there and I don't talk about equipment much as we discussed earlier. So, um, so it's not like it's loaded with, you know, old equipment references. Um, I think people are getting a little bit of the stuff that maybe I went through earlier, but it was kind of intended as a basic course. So I think it still works pretty well in the, in the video course though, I use different <laughs> examples. Um, and, um, and I, I got more into marketing video, for example. So if you have a store or if you're a real estate agent, or you're in a business where you want to be making marketing video for your website or for, uh, sending to your customers uh, or for, for advertising online, I think you'll get a lot more out of this course than is presently in the book. So that's something I probably will update. Although I'm toying with the idea of doing a whole book just on marketing video, because that's a pretty, mm. pretty deep subject. How, how would you, um, let's say, convince uh, uh, the um, people to vote for a particular, uh, a, a particular uh, uh, pol uh, pol pol political party? How would you convince them? I think that um, if you're going to use video to convince them, you first have to understand who you're going after, right? So who exactly is it you're talking to? That's one of the first most important things uh, for any video project, right? So if you're doing a home video, for example, you know that you're really making this video for yourself and your family to look at five years from now. Um, if you're doing a marketing video, you want to kind of keep in mind your best customer, you know, who, who thinks you're fantastic already and what do they love about you and what do you want to tell those people? And so I think the same thing goes for political advertising, which is, you know, if you're doing a positive political ad for your candidate, your first question is, well, what's magical about this candidate? What do people already love about them? What do people uh, feel about them that is important to them? And you want to tell stories around those things that are most important, you know, so that it's not just a formulaic <laughs> fashion of your opponent or he loves America, you know, which is not particularly convincing to anybody who's seen 800,000 political ads. But basically, and maybe I misunderstood you, but you're talking about uh, speaking to the people that already agree with the politics that you're that you're pushing. I'm talking about trying to change the minds of people that think differently, that are on a different, the different other political. Right. So, so yeah, no, I, I may have mixed up the way I answered it, but I actually did mean that. So the best way to convince someone about your benefits as a politician is to 
understand what people already love about you so that you can use your commercial and your advertising to get that message to more people who don't already know you. Because the best, easiest way to find an audience for any product is to find the people who already love you and look for more people like that, right? So it's not, it's not, almost, it's almost never the case that a politician has 100% name recognition in a market. Similar to the fact that, uh, you know, if I am advertising my video course, not 100% of the people in the United States have ever heard of it or heard of me, right? But if I know what people like about the book and know what they like about me as a teacher, those are the things I want to get across to more people. So similarly, if you're a politician and you really understand what people love about you, you want to get that message and that story out to those people. Or if you have a pizza shop, same thing. What do they love about your pizza? Not what do they think is okay about it, but what do they love about it? And those are the messages that you want to lead with when you're taking your advertising out into the world. How about if there's nothing to love about them? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and you should find another close. line of work or close your pizza shop for sure. Yeah. What's probably been very interesting or cool for you is in the last five, 10 years, uh, YouTube shorts, Instagram reels, TikTok has completely opened up this new generation of people obsessed with video content, mm -hmm. who probably have no training in it at all, right? Yeah. You notice that or yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think the good ones, it, the good ones are really good. I mean, they're super entertaining. Um, yeah. But I don't There's think that, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's like, I don't know if you're, if you're old enough to remember when computers first <clears> came <throat> out, it might've been the nineties, desktop publishing was all the rage. And it was suddenly the case that you could, you could make a page of stuff and print it that, you know, with type styles and other things that, you know, and graphics and all that stuff. And you could do that and get it out there. And everybody was all excited because desktop publishing was going to revolutionize the world because it brought publishing to the people. The problem is none of the people know how to publish something that looks interesting, right? So um, who was I? Oh, uh, I'm trying to remember who the TV director was. Uh, Jim Burroughs, I think. I was listening to a podcast last week who directs Frasier and directed like Cheers and these other historic shows. And he said, you know, that, there's in my day there were there were three networks and there were 30 great comedy writers now there's mm -hmm. 300 networks and there's still 30 great comedy writers mm -hmm. and yeah. and i think he's he's right about that it's like just because we can do it doesn't mean there's more people who are great at it than there used to be and mm -hmm. so i think uh so it's nice that people some people recognize that and want the training and the and right, the right. and the help getting better do you think that's an innate, just something you're born with, or like just a skill set that some people don't work towards in the same way? Being able to shoot video? Yeah, or the comedy writing or whatever it is, you know? Um, I think you're either funny or not, but translating that into a medium for others to consume is partly a craft. So you need to learn how to actually do it well. And that just takes practice. So if you're if you're already kind of funny, you can learn how to write funny or shoot funny or do stand-up comedy funny, right? If you're not funny at all, probably you should go into another line of work, right? Yeah. yeah. We watch a lot of uh, TikTok <laughs> or Instagram reels of just for, for hours we can sit on them and <laughs> a lot of cringe stuff out there. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, up, oh, oh, thoughts, thoughts. Yeah, tons of thoughts. Mm. I guess what, what I've been thinking about the most as of late, what you said was when you're talking about literacy for people with technology, I mean, with um, the video coming out, and you were talking about earlier about perspective and, you know, art and all that jazz. Well, it makes me think like, I don't know that it seems really important to get literacy because like, say I'm like a, a 13 year old bully and I'm giving my perspective of someone on the social media 
I should probably have some understand like because you know social media is such a big deal and you know I don't know young teens are so big on fitting in and whatnot it seems like it'd be a good idea for people to have some literacy on this types of stuff before you ruin kids lives I guess or something or people's perspectives anyway that's it that's kind of what I've been daydreaming about one of those things you've been saying but um just that what you're doing is really important I, I really and just that literacy that the video literacy is important and it's going to get more important so I kind of and that's what I've just been nerding out don't really have any questions just just want to learn more myself actually more than anything Great. Well, on the, uh, I have, I think probably 300 articles about video on the website that you can read for free. And then I have the new course and the book is, you know, available wherever people buy books. So, um, so I hope you'll take a look and send me what, tell me what you think, you know, send some comments along. I don't know. I can't. I can't tell a story. So the sentence would probably be really <laughs> raggedy. I'm <be> like, <laughs> great. <laughs> I'll mark them up with a red pen and send them back. <laughs> I've actually never seen Grandpa's concert videos. He's probably been hiding them or something. Uh, but... Check out. Uh, just be frank. Just be frank. A... <laughs> Google it. Just, just what you needed. How how'd your how'd your filming turn out? I haven't done much filming at all. I really haven't. Okay. I, I, you know, I tried a little bit Not of video. Great. The camera was too darn complicated for me to start learning the uh, SX uh, the Sony. So I bought a very high-end Nikon camera, which is a good camera, but maybe not quite as good, but it's still darn good. And uh, maybe I'll get a little experience with it, but I really haven't done much video at all. I'm going to be doing a video next month with the ch same cellist I've been working with and, and a concert pianist, but... Other than that, I don't really do much right now. Uh, as I know we only have like ten minutes left, but big question, Steve. I don't, but uh, uh, what got you interested? Like, what made you want to get into film? Were you into something beforehand? Is this like, have you been on the straight and narrow the whole time, or did you jump careers? Uh, well, I've always liked entertainment. So I started in radio and then I went into commercials and then I went into film and television. Nice. Um, nice. It's just a, um, a, I guess I was born that way. I'm not really sure. Nobody else in my family does it. Although there's a bunch of writers in the family. So, and that's really where I start with all my stuff. So. And what tips would you give grandpa for his upcoming <laughs> filming? Well, first, I would say find a camera that you like and can handle. And I'd start with a phone because they shoot amazing video. They're easy to work. And, uh, you know, just remember to hold it like this and not like this. Okay. So you want to hold it the wide way. And that way you'll get something that looks really great on YouTube. Um, and if you, uh, there are programs out that will, live switch a bunch of phones into a, like, so what I mean, like if you're watching a football game, they've got 20 cameras going and there's a director in a truck who's pushing the button that shows which camera you're gonna see on your TV screen at home, right? There's software like that that's really inexpensive for, um, for uh, home use where you can take a whole bunch of phones, uh, iOS phones, and you can cause them to be controlled by an iPad and you wow. can have your own switcher at home. So if you take three oh. cameras on, put them on tripods and use oh. that little switcher program, which is called Switcher Studio is one of them that I like to use. Uh, no paid endorsement there, I just happen to like it. <laughs> if you use Switcher Studio, you can run a video with three iPhones at once and you can do that while you're recording your great audio for your cello performance and there'll be movement and you'll be able to go close up on stuff on the screen so you can see the fingers and you can see a wide shot when you want it or a face that's intently concentrating and your video will look way better than if you are just using one single Sony FX that you don't understand how to use. What about sound quality? I would not rely on a, the question, <laughs> it's funny that you asked that without your microphone in front of your mouth. I know. That's good. 
So, Three so the question was sound quality. The answer is right. always use an external recording device or microphone. So um, don't ever rely on an iPhone camera for recording or a, or an Android camera for recording sound. If you're farther than two feet away, and you really need to hear what somebody's saying or doing, because they'll pick up, you know, the air conditioning and the computer fan and the you know, cat meowing and all that other stuff, then you don't want any of that. So um, so set up your mic separately, which it sounds like you're doing anyway. And you, I use Neumann, yeah, and you can just sync them Neumann to Neumann condensers that are the high-end Neumanns and AKGs. Yeah. In, in pro video, we shoot the sound and the video separately all the time, every time. Sometimes we have uh, multiple recordings of the same audio going on at once. And then, so and you, on a set, you know, we'll... Then you sync them in post-production, right? You sync them. Correct. Yes. Yeah. But sound is so important. You know, you're absolutely right to, to focus on that because bad sound, you know, makes people want to kill themselves instead of watching your video. You know, it's really awful. Um, but on a set with the actors, you know, where you're, if you're shooting a movie or a commercial, we'll have the actors will wear a lavalier mics, really high quality mics that'll that'll be wirelessly fed into an audio recorder. And then we'll also have somebody running a boom above them. So if one of the two of them fails or if one doesn't sound great because of wind or something, we can flip back and forth or we can combine them in the mix so that we get great audio every time. Do, do you miss not doing um, uh, radio work? Uh, I get to be on podcasts, so. No, uh, um, I did love, I love radio. I just went to the Radio Hall of Fame last week because uh, a friend of mine was being inducted. My friend Bob Rivers is now induct, an inductee in the Radio Hall of Fame. So I was in New York for that party last week. Um, and it was nice to see all the people that I grew up with. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, I did radio enough to know that I wanted to do video and television, so. Video the radio. And, there you uh, go. For for a for a microfilm for what I'm doing on Saturday, uh, two minutes of quick uh, advice. What 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 is the number one thing you'd recommend? Uh, I would recommend. Is it scripted? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. I would recommend planning your shots carefully. So mm -hmm. in the um, in both the book and the, the video course, I have a full chapter on shot lists. So when I'm doing a commercial, I will sit down and go through every single line of the script and go, well, how do I want to shoot this? Do I want to be in a drone above? Do I want to be in a hole in the ground? Do I want to be looking through the refrigerator? Do you know what kind of lens are we talking about? How close up do we want to be? Um, what's the action in this shot and do I need to capture it wide and tight and super tight? Um, do I want an alternate to this shot for my edit room? So all those are questions that I think about for several weeks before I shoot a commercial and I make a big long list of all the shots I could possibly want um, until I have enough shots to shoot for an entire week on a 30 second commercial. But since I only have a day, I then go through and cut all the shots that I don't really want. And I think about how they're going to go together. And I think about which ones are exciting. And then I think about, well, if I'm going to run out of time, which ones do I want to dump? And which ones can I absolutely not leave the set without getting because I'll be screwed in my edit? And doing that work ahead of time means that when you get on the set with all your friends on Saturday, you're not going to have to solve those problems while they're staring at you, wondering why you didn't fix them before. Right. So my advice is to make a really good shot list of every shot you want to get, put it in some kind of shooting order that, that makes it easy to shoot and think about how long each of those is going to take you to get so that you don't try to do five days worth of work in a day. And so that you get really get the stuff you want and really get creative with all of your shooting. Uh, Steve, Oh, I'm sorry. Steve, how do you uh, pick a crew, in particular the actors? How do you go about picking the right actors for 
whatever type of well actors audition for jobs right so so they they will um if i'm doing a commercial you know we say hey we want a six foot tall guy with a full beard who's not very muscular has a giant stomach and looks like he could be a football guy you know and then the casting agent will look for all the good people they know who fit that description and who can act and who they think I'll like. And then we line them up and talk to them in a day and they read the part and we see how they look. So it's an audition process. Um, in a film, you know, you make, if, if it's a very well-known actor, you'll, you'll, you won't audition them, but you'll make an offer. And if they like the script and they like the money you've offered them, then you'll meet with them and see if you all see eye to eye before you hire them. Um, but even in something like Brandon's going to do, it's really important to know that you have the right people for the right part, because if you don't have the right people for the right part, um, you'll never be able to get them to do what you want them to do on set and your movie will not come out the way you want it to come out. Sierra, I haven't, are you still with us? I'm always oh. here lurking in the shadows. <laughs> well, you, I'm always with you. You usually have words of wisdom. So do you have anything to, any question or anything? I'm just soaking it all in, you know, do more. I, <laughs> but it's all, it's all good info. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, not in a rigid way, right? But in a, I've thought about this and I see the pros and cons way. I mean, when you, when you, when you go from a script to the set, it, things are always going to change. You know, the light isn't exactly like you thought it was going to be in the backyard. And, you know, that tree isn't really where you pictured it in your head, even though you went and looked at it three days ago. And so, and the actor is hoarse that day and, they just don't get the line the way you do, even though you sent them the script and talked about it. Stuff happens, right? So you don't want to be rigidly stuck to your shot list, but you do want to think about as much as you can before you get there. So I would argue, e even if you're doing a home video, um, let's say you're let's say you're shooting uh, your son's graduation from college. Well, they hand you a shot list when you walk in. It's called a program. And it says what's going to happen next, right? So you can look at that program and you can go, well, I should probably walk over here about then because that's where the action's going to be. Or I'm looking around the auditorium and I see some really cool stuff going on that I definitely want to get when my son gets his diploma, right? Or I want to, mm -hmm. it's better for me to go up close, but I'll be in the way of those parents and there might be a fist fight. So maybe I'll shoot video screen. <clears throat> you know, these are things that you can think of whenever you're shooting in your head, you should start shot listing and think about the possibilities that you're going to face. Um, so yes, I would think about those as far in advance as you can. And then on the day, you may throw it all away, but you'll at least have thought about it. Uh, which uh, iPhone model are you going to use on the next shoot? I don't use iPhones for shoots. Um, I have, I have directors of photography who bring really big, expensive cameras, I was joking. um, but I do use iPhones around the house and I use whatever one is handy. You know, the newer ones all look great. So, hmm. thank you for coming on the show and, uh, I appreciate you and I, yeah, my last thoughts are thank you for all the words of wisdom and good food for thought. Appreciate you coming on the show, Steve. I think he gave me some really good tips to help me with, with the video. Thank you so much for coming. I have been through some of your articles and it is just a lot of really good, you're really good at explaining things and you're really good at breaking it down from just step, you're great at explaining just from step one. Like I've been told there's a camera in my hands, but I can't confirm that for sure. And moving from there so like everybody can learn and everybody can get the basics of it i can't wait to share a lot of the stuff on your website with um some other students that i know that are interested in film and production and video and just thank you for coming and sharing with us uh well thanks for having me i appreciate it um i've enjoyed the conversation very relaxed happy to come again the um 
the website is stevestockman.com and uh, there's a lot of free stuff, so please use it. Podcasting with Grandpa Bart and Rosie, always on his shoulder, this is Grandpa and Chill. Grandpa and Chill is brought to you by your hosts, Brandon Fox, Bart Frank, and Finest Jackson. Our producer is Sierra Doss. To watch and listen to full episodes of the show and follow us on social media, visit grandpaandchill.com. That's grandpaandchill.com.